The next section is student selection criteria. How do we accept students into the program? That's what we're going to talk about. I've been alluding to this for quite a ways in all these videos and stuff, so now we're going to finally get to the nitty-gritty. How do we accept students into the program? In summary, acceptance into the program is based on things like academic grades. You have to have a minimum academic eligibility to be ready for our program, to be accepted into our program. Overall previous college coursework, which is basically saying academic eligibility. We also have that formal interview that has been described that is an integral part of our application acceptance process. Same with the clinical site visit or job shadow. So I'll talk about how all these things combine to determine whether or not you're accepted into the program. So I mentioned academic eligibility. Here's our current requirements. These may change or vary from year to year, so be sure and read through this very carefully. These are our current guidelines for academic eligibility. So you have to have taken at least a certain number of classes and with a certain GPA and have a certain number of points. I'll talk about points in just a little bit in order to be eligible for the program. So once that's the first thing you send to me, remember from your uh, application procedures, is the first thing you send to me is a program interest form and your transcript so that we can verify academic eligibility. So that's what I'm going to be looking at is this stuff here in verifying your academic eligibility. Now, uh, you know, I'm scanning through or skipping through some of this stuff, but as you probably have no doubt figured out by now, um, don't think just because I maybe skipped through some stuff that you can skip through it as well. You need to read all of this to get the context. I'm just going to kind of try to hit the highlights. Now, this talks about something called competitive and non-competitive situations or clinics or whatever, or non-competitive entry. So let's talk about what is meant by competitive and non-competitive. Non-competitive is... is uh, Really, this is going to be applied mostly to uh, people that are distant students. So it says here as kind of a definition, non-competitive simply means, as an example, if a distance clinical site has only one student applying for that site, the student is not competing with other students for that site. This really simplifies matters, and if the student meets the academic eligibility requirements of the program, and the clinical site accepts the student through the job shadow and interview process, Boom! You're accepted into the program. Easy as pie. Easy as that, really. So again, say you're living in a remote area, or say you're, say you're the only person in North Carolina that's applying for our program. And we've established a clinical site for you that wants to have a student, and you've already been in contact with them. You've done your job shadow, your clinical interview, and you've uh, been approved by the clinic, and they say, yeah, we like this person, we really want them as our student, and you like them, and you've got our, our eligibility, our academic eligibility already taken care of, you're in. The only thing you would have to worry about is if maybe before the May 31st hard deadline, if somebody else in North Carolina in your same town wanted that same clinical site, then you would be competing for a clinical site if that clinic said, oh, we only want to have one student. So then you might be competing, you might be competitive, and I'll talk about that. But if somebody uh, approaches us after the May 31st deadline, wanting that same clinical site as you, we're going to say, sorry, uh, we've already got somebody lined up for that and our deadline has passed. So that's kind of where deadlines can apply for distant students to a degree. So I'm going to kind of skip through some stuff here, go to talking about competitive entry. Now competitive entry is what we really always see in Amarillo. And we may see for some distant sites as well, where we have more people applying for a clinical site than we have clinical spaces for. That consistently happens in Amarillo and pretty often in Lubbock as well, that we have more people applying than we can have spots for. So how do we determine which people get accepted into these competitive entry clinical sites? Haha, <laughs> that's where this point system comes into play. So the point system consists of things like your academic classes. So if you've taken those general education classes described earlier, say you took freshman composition, math, anatomy and physiology, and those non-radiation therapy classes, then we look at those classes and we assign you a certain number of points. In short, the better the grades, the more the points you get. And we can, you can see here that we uh, weight or tilt more heavily towards A&P because it's a more challenging class, so we think you should get, a, get more points for taking a more challenging class. And it's also more relevant to what we teach and what we do. If somebody does well in A&P, they tend to have a better chance of doing better in my classes and vice versa. If somebody doesn't do very well in A&P, they tend to not do as well in our classes. So A&P is weighted a little bit more heavily. So this is the, the point structure that we have here. So we look at all of your classes that apply for these points 
and add up your academic points. Now, like social behavior of sciences, for instance, say if there, there's a long list of classes that satisfy our social and behavioral science elective credit. If you've taken like three classes that are in that list, I just look at the classes you've taken and I pick the one with the highest grade. So that way you always get the benefit of the doubt with respect to points for any category where you've taken multiple classes that might satisfy a particular category. So that's how you, that's one way to earn points. You can also get extra points tacked on with some previous college credit. If you've had, uh, uh, if you've demonstrated that you can succeed in, cl in college classes, and you can get some more points for that. You can also get more points for having completed all of your general education stuff, depending on your grades. And for getting college honors, like for really what I have for college honors, is if you, if you have a semester as a full-time student of a 3.4 or better GPA, then I give you one point. You can do that up to three times. And also, if you make like a 4.0 as a full-time student, then you can get two points as well. So you can just you know tack on some points here and there. Then the clinical site visit, there's a form later on that we'll take a quick look at where you get evaluated for your job shadow by the radiation therapy staff. And they circle the ratings, basically. And those ratings are going to translate into points that can be added to your point total as well. Same thing with the formal interview. The formal interview is actually pretty heavily weighted with respect to points. Uh, so the formal interview can add points as well. So there's descriptions about that process here and about the, the deadlines and dates for the interview. So do kind of read this over so that you're very well aware of the deadlines and dates. And some of the deadlines, actually, now that I think of it, some of the deadlines may change a little bit from year to year. So we typically have like the, the deadline for the application process, May 31st. Then we have the interviews on the first Saturday in June. Suppose the first Saturday in June is is like Saturday, June 1st, the day after the deadline, <laughs> then there's not going to be time for you to really know if you're accepted into the interview process or not. We'd like to give you at least a, a, a two or three days notice uh, for your interview in Amarillo. So we might move that to like the second Saturday in June. But typically on a given year, it's the first Saturday in June. So be sure and check this for details. And here it talks about the details about exactly how the interview process can add or even subtract points from your total. So if you don't do well in the interview process, if you do really well, it can rack up a lot of points. If you don't do well, it can subtract points. And if you do miserably poorly, then if you get unanimous zero, this is really important. If you get unanimous zeros from the entire interview panel, then no matter what your other academic points are, they basically have stated they don't want you in the clinic. And you're not going to be accepted into the clinic no matter what your other points are. So do kind of keep that in mind as well. Then here's some information about conditional acceptance into the program. If you get through all these uh, hoops that we that you jump through and you're accepted into the program, then I'm going to send you an email that basically tells you other stuff to do uh, so that you can finalize your acceptance. And that's things like get a TB test, get your CPR certification, undergo the criminal background check. Those things that I've been talking about but have said that you didn't have to do just yet. So those are the things you would do to kind of get final acceptance. And if any of your contact information changes, I have to know. There was a case, this has been a long time ago. It's been maybe 20 years. But there was one time where somebody was accepted into the program, and I sent them their acceptance email, and I never heard back from them. And I kept trying to send them emails, and emails is how I contact people. So I always have to have your current and email address and one that you check on a regular basis. Oh, by the way, something that I'm thinking about now. Oh, let me give you a, a, a keyword before I forget about that. How about the keyword being password, all one word, password, P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D. So, what I was thinking about, you know that Amarillo College Health Science Central application. I said they'll send you an email whenever that's all complete. They'll send you an email to your email address that Amarillo College gives you. Amarillo College will give you your own Amarillo College email. Really important to check that email from time to time because that's where you're going to get that information. If you're using your personal email address, you might not get communications from us. If at any time you don't get communications from us, uh, from me especially, email and phone me to let me know. So be sure to check your Amarillo College email once you make application to Amarillo College. Don't just kind of forget about that because that's how you're going to be getting vital information. So anyway, getting back to my story, there was a person uh, a, a long time ago that was accepted in the program. I kept sending her emails, trying to tell her what to do and formalize her application and her acceptance process. Uh, and I never heard back from her, so I gave away her spot. 
And then she shows up for classes on the first day of school, and I had to tell her, mm, sorry, you didn't do uh, what you were supposed to do. You didn't fulfill all your conditional acceptance stuff, getting your TB test and all this stuff, because she wasn't checking her email. She didn't receive the information. So she got left out. So bad things can happen. Okay, so. Oh, I got to give you another keyword here. How about, uh, even though we're finished with this section, how about another keyword of bottle, B-O-T-T-L-E, B-O-T-T-L-E. That does it for that this little section. Now you know all about the application procedures. Yay. And now you know also all about how we accept students in the program. Yay. Yay. Now I'm just being goofy and ridiculous and I need a break. Yay.